Hello, wonderful staff of the Northwest Kidney Center, particularly at the flagship unit in Kent, where, incidentally, we are hiring. Uh, if you are a dialysis technician or a nurse looking to advance your career, come join our growing team of superstars. Uh, so today we're going to explore the wonderful world of calcium. Uh, a shout out to Leslie uh, at the Burien uh, Northwest Kidney Center unit for requesting this topic. Um, calcium is an incredibly important element with respect to human physiology. Um, it's critical uh, for our teeth, um, bones, muscles, nerves, um, and unfortunately, normal calcium physiology is disrupted by renal failure. So in the dialysis profession, we have to work very hard to maintain calcium levels in the normal range uh, for our patients. Uh, today we have four objectives. Uh, first, we will review calcium physiology. Second, uh, we'll discuss both dietary calcium intake as well as the use of calcium-based dietary phosphorus binders. We'll discuss the concept of calcium balance and uh, hopefully leave you with an appreciation of the impact uh, that the dialysate calcium concentration can have on clinical outcomes. Let's begin by sharing some fun facts about calcium. So calcium is a metal, and it's the 20th element of the periodic table. Its name comes from the Latin words calces or calx, meaning lime. And that's because the Romans have been using calcium oxide since the first century AD to make lime, uh, which is used as a mortar uh, to hold bricks together. And you can still see uh, a lot of Roman structures held together uh, by mortar composed of um, lime. But it wasn't until 1808 that calcium was officially isolated and therefore discovered uh, by a British scientist by the name of Humphrey Davy. Calcium is sometimes known as the fifth place element. It's the fifth most abundant element by mass in the Earth's crust. It's the fifth most abundant dissolved ion in seawater. And it's the fifth most abundant element in the human body. That said, it is the most abundant metal in the human body, found mainly uh, in bones and teeth. If you could extract all the calcium from the average adult person, you'd have about two pounds or one kilogram of the metal. Uh, calcium is essential for animal and plant nutrition. Uh, it participates in many biochemical reactions, uh, including uh, building skeletal systems, self signaling, uh, and moderating uh, muscle action. Let's turn our attention to normal calcium physiology. Calcium is the most abundant metal found in the body. Approximately 99% of calcium is uh, distributed in the bones and the teeth, and the remaining 1% is found in blood and soft tissues. Calcium has many functions. Uh, for example, it's important for forming strong bones and teeth, uh, it helps muscles contract as well as relax for normal movement. Um, it helps transmit nerve impulses. It enables blood to clot normally. It regulates cell secretion, cell division, and cell multiplication. And finally, it's critical for many enzymatic reactions in the body. The human body works very hard to maintain blood calcium levels within a certain range. And there are a couple of hormones involved in maintaining calcium levels. These are probably familiar to you. There's vitamin D as well as parathyroid hormone or PTH. Uh, vitamin D is a steroid hormone uh, which regulates calcium levels primarily by increasing intestinal calcium absorption. If you don't have enough vitamin D in your bloodstream, you don't absorb enough calcium from your intestines and then your calcium level runs low. Um, vitamin D levels are typically low in dialysis patients because the kidneys normally help synthesize the activated form of vitamin D. Um, if you don't have good kidney function, you don't make as much vitamin D as you need, and then you have low calcium levels. Um, calcium levels are also low uh, 
in dialysis patients because of phosphorus retention. Um, turns out that high phosphorus suppresses the renal synthesis of um, an enzyme called 1-alpha hydroxylase, which is important in synthesizing vitamin D. The bottom line is that calcium usually runs low in patients with kidney failure because they don't have enough vitamin D in their body uh, and because of phosphorus retention. That's why we give our patients vitamin D in the form of intravenous Zemplar or paracalcitol. Parathyroid hormone, or PTH, is produced by parathyroid glands. These are four small glands in the neck. Um, the purpose of PTH is to maintain serum calcium levels within the normal range. Um, so PTH gets secreted from the parathyroid glands, and it goes into the blood, and it circulates to the bone, where it binds to receptors on cells called osteoclasts. These are Pac-Man-like cells uh, which chew up bone in a process called remodeling. This releases calcium and phosphorus into the blood. Uh, it's important for maintaining calcium levels of the blood, and it's also important for maintaining bone strength. Um, the major regulator of PT8 secretion is low calcium. Low calcium levels are a very potent stimulus of PTH release. Uh, so for example, uh, if we don't drink our milk or eat our cheese or whatever, um, our calcium levels run a little bit lower, and that stimulates the release of parathyroid hormone, which again activates the osteoclast to dissolve calcium from our bone. Um, Minute changes in serum ionized calcium levels are sensed by something called a calcium sensing receptor, uh, which is expressed on the surface of parathyroid cells. Let's now turn our attention to the dietary intake of calcium. Dairy products and grains are the primary sources of dietary calcium, account for about three quarters of our dietary intake. Other sources of calcium include protein-rich foods, vegetables, and fruits. The recommended dietary allowance, or RDA, of calcium for adults is about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams daily. Um, if the calcium intake is low, calcium will be effectively borrowed from the bones. Uh, an overall course of many years, low calcium intake can cause osteoporosis, which is a bone disease in which the bone lose minerals, uh, become very weak, and break easily. That said, calcium supplementation is controversial. Um, investing too many calcium supplements may increase the risk of vascular calcifications, heart attacks, kidney stones, and potentially mortality. Uh, more on this shortly. Dietary calcium recommendations for people with chronic kidney disease are different than those of the general population. Uh, this is in part because with progression of chronic kidney disease, phosphorus levels tend to accumulate in the blood, and that can bind to the calcium and lead to lower calcium levels or hypocalcemia. Uh, additionally, almost all dialysis patients are deficient in vitamin D. Recall that kidneys synthesize vitamin D. So if you don't have enough if you don't have kidney function, you don't make enough vitamin D. If you don't have vitamin D, you can't absorb calcium normally from the intestines, and that contributes to low calcium levels as well. So dialysis patients may need more calcium supplementation than the general population. According to the National Kidney Foundation uh, that puts forth these guidelines called the KDOKI, or Kidney Dialysis Outcome Quality Initiative, um, the elemental calcium intake for people with kidney disease should not be greater than 1,500 milligrams daily. Um, as an aside, elemental calcium is about 40% by weight of calcium carbonate. So if you take 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate or Tums, this contains about 400 milligrams of elemental calcium. Another common source of dietary calcium intake is the use of calcium-containing dietary phosphorus binders. The most commonly prescribed one is calcium carbonate or Tums, which binds to phosphorus in the jejunum with moderate binding efficacy. Tums works great for heartburn, it's chewable, it's very inexpensive, uh, and historically it's been an appealing uh, first choice binder because it also addresses the hypocalcemia uh, that is often seen with hyperphosphatemia in patients with chronic kidney disease.
Uh, the main concern with its use as a binder include hypercalcemia uh, and potential accelerated vascular calcification, particularly when it's combined with vitamin D therapy. Another commonly used calcium containing dietary phosphorus binder is calcium acetate or phospho. It has higher efficacy, uh, binding efficacy for phosphorus than Tums or Cevelimer. Uh, can cause nausea, constipation, and dry mouth. Um, it has lower calcium load than Tums. So it binds the same amount of phosphorus with about half the elemental calcium. Um, it's more expensive than Tums by far, and still patients are taking in calcium, so there is potential risk of hypercalcemia. Uh, with vascular calcification. Let's now turn our attention to the issue of dietary calcium supplementation. In both the general as well as the dialysis population, there is concern that calcium supplementation appears to increase the risk of vascular disease and overall mortality. In the general population, observational studies suggest that calcium intake that consistently exceeds the RDA for older adults, especially when a substantial amount of calcium is derived from calcium supplements, accelerates arterial calcification and raises the risk of cardiovascular events. Um, several retrospective studies have provided evidence of increased incidence of acute myocardial infarction or heart attacks among older women with high calcium intakes, again, especially comforting from calcium supplements. Um, in these reports, uh, calcium intakes were typically in the range of 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day, and calcium supplements contributed substantially to these totals. So how exactly does calcium supplementation increase the risk of vascular calcification? Well, this was studied by a researcher named Yang, who uh, in 2004 incubated vascular smooth muscle cells. In other words, took cells from the wall of the blood vessels, grew them in a Petri dish uh, in a normal calcium bath. First thing he did was to add more calcium to the broth in which these cells were growing. And when he did that, he noticed that they produced way more calcification. So in other words, they began to produce bone protein uh, that led to calcification of the cells. He repeated the experiment by adding more phosphorus, uh, increasing the phosphorus concentration, and they produced even more bone protein, so they calcify even more. And then when he increased both the phosphorus and the concentration of the broth in the petri dish in which these vascular smooth muscle cells were growing, he saw way more calcification. So it turns out that high calcium levels as well as high phosphorus levels upregulate genes inside of the cells responsible for producing bone proteins. Essentially, uh, they are turning to bone. It turns out that vascular calcification is a predictor of long-term reduced mortality. This is a study of 110 stable dialysis patients who were followed for about five years, uh, and they underwent a CAT scan to find out how many blood vessels, how many arteries were calcified. Uh, survival was best in those who had no blood vessels calcified, and survival was a quarter of that uh, for patients who had four or more arteries that were calcified. So vascular calcification uh, increases mortality. So we know that if we give our dialysis patients too much calcium, we can increase the risk of vascular calcifications, which is bad. Then again, we want to make sure that we give them enough calcium. We don't want them to uh, not have sufficient calcium, for example, to maintain healthy bones. And this introduces the concept of something called calcium balance. Determining exactly how much calcium is needed in a dialysis patient is a challenge. Um, normally, excess calcium in the body is removed in the urine, but most dialysis patients don't make much urine, which increases the risk of calcium accumulation. In general, if a dialysis patient consumes more calcium than is removed by the dialysis procedure, then calcium accumulates in the body. And this leads to what we call a positive calcium balance. On the other hand, if the dialysis procedure removes more calcium than the patient consumes, there is a net loss of calcium from the body, and this is called a negative calcium balance.
A positive calcium balance frequently occurs in dialysis patients for several reasons. And these include dietary calcium intake, so a lot of dialysis patients still consume more than the recommended amounts of dairy products. The use of calcium-containing dietary phosphorus binders. The administration of vitamin D in the form of Zemplar. And as I mentioned earlier, diminished or absent ability to excrete calcium in the urine. Um, so the positive calcium balance coupled with high phosphorus levels contributes to calcium deposition in soft tissues as well as blood vessels. Whether or not to maintain a dialysis patient in a state of positive or negative calcium balance depends on the individual patient. Sometimes we prefer a positive calcium balance. Consider a patient who has undergone a subtotal parathyroidectomy and is recovering from high turnover bone disease, what we call osteitis fibrosa, and now bone formation is greater than reabsorption. In this situation, the bones need a lot of calcium, so it would make sense to uh, leave that patient with a positive calcium balance. On the other hand, uh, a positive calcium balance may be harmful in a hemodialysis patient with what we call adynamic or low turnover bone disease in which the calcium cannot be used to form new bone and instead gets uh, deviated towards pathologic deposition in soft tissues. Uh, in this situation, uh, a low or neutral calcium balance may be appropriate. The concentration of calcium in the dialysate is another important factor in determining the net calcium balance of dialysis patients. Calcium can be removed from or administered to a patient during the dialysis procedure depending on the calcium concentration in the dialysate. If we use a high calcium bath, calcium will diffuse into the patient during dialysis as if we were giving that patient an intravenous infusion of calcium. On the other hand, if we use a low calcium dialysate bath, then calcium will diffuse out of the patient. Um, the optimal dialysate calcium concentration uh, to maintain normal mineralization of bone as well as reduce the risk of cardiovascular events in hemodialysis patients is debated. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of each uh, calcium bath, which we'll discuss momentarily. During the introduction of chronic hemodialysis in the 1960s, a dialysate calcium concentration of 2.5 milliequivalents per liter uh, was used because it was close to the physiologic concentration of ionized calcium in the blood. Now, at the time, we didn't have Zemplar or Sinicalcid or basically any other medicines to control hyperparathyroidism. So virtually all of our patients early on had hypocalcemia and severe secondary hyperparathyroidism, so really high PTH levels. Um, turns out that hypocalcemia uh, was associated with low blood pressure, so it sort of drove intradialytic hemodynamic instability. Uh, it also contributed to what we call high turnover bone disease or renal osteodystrophy because low calcium stimulates the release of PTH. So in the 1970s, people decided to increase the dialysate calcium concentration to 3.5 milliequivalents uh, per liter, and that was considered optimal for dialysis patients. But again, it essentially amounted to giving an intravenous calcium infusion during dialysis. Um, so uh, dialysis units around the country used a high dialysate calcium concentration for a long time, for many years, even after calcium binders had almost completely replaced aluminum hydroxide um, and after calcitriol and other vitamin D analogs became available. In the 1980s, uh, there was increasing awareness that high calcium dialysate concentrations in combination with calcitriol and the use of calcium-based dietary phosphorus binders was contributing to hypercalcemia. Um, and that led to recommendations of the KDOKI Kidney Dialysis Outcome Quality Initiative to um, reduce the dialysate calcium concentration back to 2.5 milliequivalents per liter, or uh, the more recent KDGO, uh, Kidney Dialysis Improving Global Outcomes recommendations of a dialysate calcium somewhere between 2.5 and 3.0 um, 
uh, millikilovolts per liter. Uh, there has been a trend towards further reduction in the dialysate uh, calcium concentrations in recent years. Using a low cal calcium dialysate concentration has some clinical benefits. For starters, it helps control calcium in the setting of excessive intestinal calcium absorption, which is often driven by the use of calcium binders, for example, or the administration of high doses of uh, vitamin D analogs. It also uh, increases circulating PTH, which can be helpful uh, in patients that have adynamic or low turnover bone disease and low PTH levels. There's also a lower chance of dystrophic calcification or metastatic calcification of the blood vessels and soft tissues. Unfortunately, there are some downsides associated with using low calcium dialysate concentration. For example, uh, it's uh, a cause of more frequent episodes of hypotension as well as cardiac rhythm disturbances. Um, probably the most life-threatening of these are ventricular arrhythmias and they tend to occur uh, when you have low calcium in association with low potassium. So the combination of those two uh, is probably uh, responsible for the ventricular arrhythmias. Low calcium dialysate can also further raise PTH, which is undesirable if the PTH is already elevated, say someone who has high turnover bone disease. Uh, in the long run, this can lead to excessive bone mineral loss, contributing to renal osteodystrophy. Low calcium dialysate is also associated with a greater chance of arrhythmias, particularly when you use a dialysate calcium concentration below 2.5 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, it's also associated with increased risk of sudden cardiac death, which may be related to prolongation of something called the QT interval. Uh, low calcium dialysate is also been associated with increased risk of cardiac arrest. So there's one study by Poon et al. published in 2013 is a case control study of 43,000 dialysis patients, um, 510 of whom experienced a witness cardiac arrest, and they, they were compared to 1,500 match controls, uh, essentially to look for risk associations between cardiac arrest and serum and dialysate calcium concentrations. It turns out that patients who are on a dialysate calcium bath of less than 2.5 were more likely to be exposed to a larger dialysis to serum calcium gradient. They had more hemodynamic instability as well as um, a greater number of episodes of cardiac arrest. Really low dialysate calcium concentrations, so say below 2.5, were also associated with an increased chance of developing heart failure. So there's this one study of more than 350 dialysis clinics that transition uh, patients who are already on 2.5 calcium baths to less than 2.5. And so they compared those that they switched over to less than 2.5 to those that stayed on the 2.5. And what they found was that not only do you have lower calcium levels as expected in the so-called converter clinics, uh, but you had higher rates of hospitalization for heart failure and uh, you had more intradialytic hypotension. So you had more hemodynamic instability associated with low calcium levels. For this and other reasons, uh, many nephrologists prefer to dialyze their patients using a high calcium dialysate. Uh, and there are several benefits. So for example, we've known for a long time that there's better hemodynamic stability associated with using a high calcium dialysate. So less hypotension. Uh, and all this probably relates to uh, better cardiac myocardial contractility as a result of high calcium. So high calcium levels, calcium is very important for, myo for muscle contraction as well as you know, uh, myocardial contractility, so contraction of the heart muscle. Um, and uh, consistent with this are studies that have demonstrated uh, that you have greater myocardial contractility uh, when you dialyze someone with a high calcium bath. Finally, um, high calcium dialysate is useful in patients who have low calcium levels, for example, uh, as a consequence of sinicalcid or sensipar use, or patients who have undergone a prior subtotal parathyroidectomy. But 
high calcium dialysate is a double-edged sword. There are significant downsides as well. For starters, it can increase the risk of what we call adynamic bone disease by over-suppressing parathyroid hormone. Recall that PTH uh, hormone activates these Pacman-like cells called osteoclasts, which chew up the bone. And chewing up the bone and then rebuilding the bone is very important for uh, developing good bone strength. And so if you don't get that constant breaking down and building up of bone, you have what we call adynamic bone disease, and that's soft, very weak bone. The elephant in the room is that high dialysate calcium concentrations are associated with the risk of hypercalcemia and what we call metastatic soft tissue calcification. So it's particularly common in patients who use calcium-containing dietary phosphorus binders and receive Zemplar or calcitriol or other vitamin D analogs. Uh, basically, these patients calcify their blood vessels. We know that increased calcification of blood vessels reduces your uh, survival. Uh, and also, you can develop soft tissue calcifications elsewhere. I mean, in the lungs or in your muscles or in your joints. Um, and all this is consistent with uh, the concern of increased mortality. The dialysis outcomes in practice pattern study uh, showed that more than 50% of patients with hypercalcemia were being treated with dialysate calcium concentrations greater than 2.5 milliequivalents per liter, and that the use of these baths was associated with increased mortality. All right, this concludes the main portion of our talk, and now let's summarize what we've learned. First, maintaining normal calcium levels in the body is physiologically very important for the function of many organs, your, your skeletal system, your teeth, your bones, the nervous system. Uh, it, it enables your blood to clot. It's critical for muscle function as well as uh, certain enzymatic processes throughout the body. The recommended uh, dietary allowance of elemental calcium is 1,000 milligrams a day for the general adult population and 1,500 milligrams a day for the dialysis population. Calcium supplementation in both the general as well as the dialysis populations is associated with an increased risk of vascular calcification in some observational studies, increase in cardiovascular mortality. So be careful if you are taking calcium supplements. Um, dialysate calcium concentration should be tailored to the patient. In most cases, a dialysate calcium concentration of 2.5 is needed to maintain a neutral or negative calcium balance, particularly for patients who are using uh, calcium-based dietary phosphorus binders. High dialysate calcium concentrations uh, are associated with greater hemodynamic, in, hemodynamic stability, so it's less hypotension, but a greater long-term chance of vascular and other metastatic calcification. Low dialysate calcium concentrations are associated with more frequent episodes of hypotension and cardiac rhythm disturbances, but a lower chance of vascular and metastatic calcification. Dialysate concentrations less than 2.5 are associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death and are generally avoided. All right, time for your quiz. Question number one, name two hormones that are important for regulating blood calcium levels. That's right, parathyroid hormone and vitamin D, excellent. Next question, true or false? Calcium supplementation is associated with an increased risk of vascular calcification. Excellent, that is uh, true, so true. Question number three, why are dialysis patients at risk for a positive calcium balance? So there are many reasons. Um, dietary intake, if you consume a lot of dairy products, um, the use of calcium-based dietary phosphorus binders, the administration of vitamin D to our patients, and the fact that most dialysis patients don't make any urine or very little urine, so they have trouble excreting calcium from their bodies. Next question, what are some short-term risks associated with using low calcium dialysate? 
right, so hypotension and arrhythmias. Next question, what is the main long-term risk of using high calcium dialysate? Excellent. Um, so calcification of blood vessels and soft tissues this is an example of knee radiographs. And so you can see all that calcium that's deposited in the soft tissue. This includes the January 2023 in-service for the Northwest Kidney Center. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. And uh, much more than that, thank you so much for the excellent care that you provide our patients. This is Andy Brokenbro signing out until next month.